Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back to the Tony Hernandez Show. I'm your host, Tony Hernandez. Today's Saturday, August 9th. It's starting to almost feel like fall outside. I saw some football teams practicing. You know what that means is that elections are right around the corner. Uh, this is a reminder that next Tuesday is the primary. Uh, there's a lot of good candidates running out there, so I encourage everybody to go out there, do your civic duty, take part, make sure you vote, educate yourself on who the candidates are. Uh, as many of you guys know, uh, Leona and I, we purchased a home not too long ago. Uh, we loved the location. It was in a perfect spot. The floor plan was beautiful. There's three bedrooms. Everything was perfect about it, except for the fact that it was covered head to toe in knotty pine. And in order for me to convince Leona to go ahead and uh, purchase this property, she said that we'd have to take all the knotty pine down and uh, make sure that we put up new drywall and have it look exactly how she wants it to look. And as you guys know out there, if your wife says something like that, more often than not, you just go ahead and do it. So basically, for the last two months, my life has consisted of working on this house and doing a little bit of work and a few weddings. But the vast majority of my time has been spent trying to get our house updated and looking the way that Leona wants it to look like. So the other day, I'm painting the inside of a closet. I'm in the highest corner, just trying to get that last spot, splash the paint up there. I'm listening to the radio and Right on uh, KS95, I start hearing this ad, and, and, and the ad says something like, if you're doing renovation work on your home or remodeling work on your home, you need to start with a plan. And I kept listening. It just caught my attention. And uh, this was a Minnesota governor's candidate. It's Scott Honor's ad. And, uh, you know, really hit home. I felt like he was actually speaking directly to me. Uh, about planning and about uh, you know making the analogy of of that with home renovation and uh, I'm honored to say that I have Scott Honor with us today live in the studio and Scott Honor welcome to the show yeah thanks for having me on Tony yeah it's great to uh, have you here you must be busy with the primary coming up here in just uh, just about when is it a couple days here? yeah this Tuesday wow so we're we're out you know every day from you know, I started this morning at 5 a.m. we'll be done you know about 11 p.m. and we're just carrying that on through Tuesday. Well, I have to say uh, congratulations on your big endorsement, and, and I'm not talking about Laura Ingraham, although that's a, that's a huge <laughs> endorsement. Uh, on the Cinco de Mayo, Dallas, if we can pop up uh, this, you had met my son, uh, Maximilian, and uh, there's a picture right there at the Cinco de Mayo parade in West St. Paul, or in the West Side. And, uh, you know, given the fact that he's not kicking and screaming, that's usually he thinks he's going to a babysitter or something. Uh, I'll take that as uh, that my son Maximilian, if he were able to vote, if you're old enough, that he'd be voting for you. <laughs> so do you think that Max's endorsement will help you at all, Scott? Well, I think so. That's a good picture there, too. And, <laughs> and he's a great kid, great temperament. So, uh, you know, they, they, they always talk about having to kiss babies. So, I, you know, had to get that experience. But he was, it was fun watching the parade with Max. Yeah, yeah. He certainly uh, enjoyed meeting you. And he's, uh, he's actually in the studio today. He doesn't come here too often, but he'll be on uh, later af after uh, you've been on. And we're going to talk to my, talk to my wife as well. But uh, can you just let everyone know, remind everyone when the primary is, and uh, just to give everyone a reminder for that? Yeah, well, it's this Tuesday, uh, August 12th, and uh, the polls will be open uh, until 8 p.m., and we're encouraging everyone to get out and vote. Uh, you can go to your polling place uh, that you vote in the regular general election, and uh, I think it's mnvotes.org is the website that you can go to to find uh, your polling place. Uh, you can let our campaign know, of course, too, at Honor for Governor, H O N O U R F O R Governor.com, if you have any questions. Uh, because we want people to come out and vote and, and exercise their constitutional rights to vote. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times uh, people think with a primary, there's pretty low turnout. Usually, I think they're predicting around 10% turnout for primary voters. But, you know, people don't understand that you don't have to be. Uh, uh, a registered Republican to vote in the Republican primary. Pretty much anybody can vote. Is that right? Well, that's right. There's uh, uh, no party registration in this state. So uh, voters are free to go to the polls. And the only requirement in the primary is to vote in one party line only. So once you get to the poll, you have to choose are you going to vote for Republican candidates, independence candidates, or Democrat candidates. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you you can make that choice and then vote regardless of how you think you might want to vote in the general election. Mm -hmm. And uh, and anyone can vote, and we want people to vote. 
So there's three other uh, pretty strong candidates running f uh, to be the Republican running in the general election. Mm -hmm. uh, why or, or how do you feel about your chances of winning the primary, Scott? Well, we really like our chances. And, and what I'm finding is voters really like uh, what Carr and Hosley, my running mate, and I are about, that we're outsiders. We haven't been in political office. Karn's a first-term state senator, so she's had two years there, just enough time to see that there's really no common sense going on there in St. Paul. Uh, but you know, what we're hearing from voters is they like our agenda, they like our approach, they like the fact that we're not career politicians. And you know, I'm running against three guys that have spent collectively half a century in political office. And so we like our chances, and, and what we're hearing from folks is that, um, uh, that they really want to see the kind of changes that we're looking to make, to get this state back on a track of being excellent. And, and uh, with that said, we're expecting a pretty low voter turnout, as you mentioned. You know, that, that's kind of what the, you know, the general expectation is out there, which means we've got to get people to come to the polls. So notwithstanding what we're hearing from voters, that they really like what we're about, uh, that's not going to matter if they don't come and vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we're really encouraging people to get out there and vote on Tuesday. Well, you mentioned your uh, running mate, State Senator Karen Housley. She uh, represents in the eastern uh, part mm -hmm. of Minnesota, that district by like Stillwater in, in that area. And, you know, I have to imagine, uh, you, A, she won an election in 2012 in a very brutal year for Republicans, and she managed to uh, eke out a victory when a lot of Republicans lost that year. So she's an extremely tough competitor and she knows how to campaign. She knows how to win. Uh, she's smart. She's energetic. She's a people person. If you talk to people around Minnesota, they know who she is. They like her. Uh, she's warm. Uh, I'd have to imagine that the three others who were running for a governor that they were trying to work or to try to earn her support to get on their side and, and ultimately she chose to join uh, your campaign and your team. Uh, why do you think uh, she made the decision uh, to join your team? Well, I agree with your sentiment. You know, I was looking to have a lieutenant governor candidate alongside me that would be a true partner someone that could help me carry this agenda forward, that could get it passed, and that once we got the state going on the right track, could help us market the state, could really serve as an ambassador to Minnesota. Mm. And, and I want this lieutenant governor position to be one that, you know, is high in stature and is very relevant. And, and uh, you know, we've underutilized this position in, for, for the last several decades. Well, when I got together with Karn and and walked her through what I was about, what we're trying to accomplish, and then you know, described the role that I wanted to have a lieutenant governor play as a true partner with me in the effort, I think that got her really fired up because you know, she and I share a core set of principles. Mm -hmm. and, and we both believe in what's possible. We're optimistic about the future of Minnesota. And we know that we could be doing so much better if we make better decisions as government. Uh, but, you know, I think when, when I walked her through the role I saw her playing as, mm -hmm. as a real partner with me, you know, that really got her fired up about joining the team. Well, she's definitely been out there. And Dallas, if you can pop up this picture that we have here. I saw State Senator Karen Housley. She's, here, here she is outside of the Oasis Cafe with her receipt. And the Oasis Cafe in Stillwater is making uh, national news because if you see right there where I'm circling, they, they have added to their receipt, and, and rightfully so, uh, a minimum wage fee of 35 cents. And there are uh, people who are in great support of the cafe, and then mm -hmm. there's others who are saying that this business owner is basically, they're equating them to, to Adolf Hitler, or some very terrible people out there uh, for adding this fee. They say, well, why can't you just add in the cost to the food or into the menu rather than having the minimum wage fee they feel like they're thumbing the nose at the new minimum wage policy but you have been one who's, who hasn't been uh, afraid to talk about many issues but you've been able to address the the minimum wage issue so i'm just curious of your own personal thoughts on uh, the oasis cafe issue and minimum wage well look, i applaud oasis cafe for you know, using their, their freedom of speech rights to, to convey what's going on, make sure that their patrons know, look, there's an impact on these decisions. Because I think so often people hear what goes on in government and they don't really understand how it relates to them personally. And here's a perfect example of, you know, the, you know we all learned in economics, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Mm -hmm. Well, 
you know, here you've got this restaurant saying, look, what are we going to do? We, we've got to figure out a way to deal with this issue. They want to employ more people, I'm sure, right? You know, because one way a lot of restaurants are having to deal with this is actually just letting people go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so they're doing the best they can to try to figure out how to deal with a new economic reality that was imposed on them by government. And they're making their patrons aware of it. Well, you know, I applaud that. That makes sense. You know, what I've said about minimum wage is, you know, l let's freeze minimum wage at this $8 an hour level and, and have it be that the legislature has to pass any increases from here, not have them happen automatically. And the reason I've said that is I want more people to have a job. You know, I worked my way through college having minimum wage jobs. Mm -hmm. I, I worked out at Lord Fletcher's, uh, started up picking up trash, and there was a dock boy and a bartender. Had a job shoveling horse manure at 5.30 every morning. Looking forward to using that skill in St. Paul. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that I, I, I was the beneficiary of having those jobs. I want more people to have jobs, and the way it works, and, and the government the government's own organizations have come out and said this, that if you, if you raise minimum wage too high, fewer people work. Well, I don't think that's good for the state. And I want to have a state where what, what creates opportunity is a prosperous economy. You know, there's, a, there's another restaurant called Punch Pizza that's based mm -hmm. here in Minnesota mm -hmm. that raised their minimum wage to $10, uh, sorry, raised their rate, wage to $10 an hour. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the president actually highlighted that in his State of the Union address this year. Mm -hmm. Well, great to applaud it, but he completely missed the point. It wasn't government telling them they had to do that. It was the economy speaking and the fact that they thought it was in the best interest of the customers, of their employees, and the shareholders to have wages go up. That's the kind of economy we want, one where wages are higher because we have a strong and prosperous economy. Mm -hmm. And that means getting government out of the way and not having government telling people and companies what they have to do. Well, I must say, you know, we were talking offset about the, the changes that occur when you become a father or a parent and, and start a family. And uh, one big difference that I've seen in just the way that, that I think and is that Beyond a doubt, I spend a lot of time, and my main concern with political issues are issues of the economy. I think about how we can save money. I think about the cost of goods. I'm trying to predict about how much money we're going to need to educate Maximilian and hopefully our other future children. Uh, how much is college going to cost? Uh, these things are constantly in my mind, and I have to imagine as you're going around uh, the state of Minnesota, is, is that what you're hearing from Minnesotans, are they mainly concerned with issues of the economy or, or what else are you hearing from Minnesotans? Well, you know, the, the economy and the opportunity to have a job and to earn more is absolutely on people's minds. Uh, you know, the governor's own Department of Employment and Economic Development uh, just came out recently and said that half of the workforce in Minnesota is underemployed, meaning you know, people are qualified to earn more than they're currently earning. And I see it in story after story. You know, I was down at, uh, at, at, the county, at uh, a county fair just the other day, and I met with a woman named Teresa, mm -hmm. uh, who has an MBA in healthcare, worked her way through school, has student loans, and she can't get the job that she was trained to be able to have. Mm -hmm. She's working two jobs to make ends meet. Well, that's not the, the strong economy that our state deserves to see. And, and what I know from my, my business experience is companies make decisions about where to create jobs based on the kinds of things that government does. So, you know, this state has too many regulations. Its taxes are too high. We're not creating competitive advantages where we could. For instance, you know, we're the place closest to North Dakota you know, that you'd actually want to live. Mm. Why not have a big pipe from there to here with that low-cost natural gas that they've got you know, coming out of the ground or that they're flaring off? Why not get that over here to have a competitive advantage in energy costs so more manufacturers locate here? And what does our governor do? He increases our electric rates by having a solar mandate put in place where the utilities have to create energy through solar power, which is uneconomical. Well, these things don't make sense. And I want to put in place the policies that are going to create more jobs here because everyone will benefit from that. Hmm. So we have a, a question from somebody in our viewing audience. Uh, they pose this question over Facebook. Her name is Nancy, and she wants to ask uh, you this, ask me to ask you this. 
Will Scott keep in contact with the state and the people and let everyone know his thoughts and why before he signs or vetoes bills? Well, that's a great question, and thanks for asking it. You know, one of the things I think we need in government is more transparency. And, and I'll endeavor to make sure that, that the citizens of the state know what we're doing and why. And by the way, I actually think this is a big opportunity for, for me and other Republicans, which is I think the Republican Party has done a relatively lousy job of conveying what we're about and why our, our ideas will make people's lives better. We're going to be out talking about what we're planning to do and why, and making sure that we have a chance to hear from folks uh, you know, their input on what we're trying to do as well. But it's going to start from the attitude of we're going to make decisions that are in the best interest of the citizens of the state. And, uh, you know, one of the, the questions that I have is that you, you chose to bypass the uh, Minnesota Republican endorsement uh, along with Representative Kurt Zellers. He also made that, that decision. Um, can you explain to everybody how and why you came to that decision to, to not go for the endorsement and to go straight for the primary? Sure. Well, you know, the primary is when the party actually chooses its, its uh, nominee. True. And our view was, let's give everyone a voice in that. And, and frankly, with the view also that the candidate that can get elect, you know, that, that wins the most votes in the primary is the one that is best able to communicate their message to a broad audience. And we need a candidate that's able to do that because we need to be able to take on the governor in November. And as Republicans, we haven't won a statewide race since 2006. And I didn't want to just play from the same playbook. And, and I had to choose where to spend my time. And while I really appreciate and respect those delegates that are so dedicated that they dedicate their time to that convention process, I knew that if, if that was the only place I spent my time, I won't be able to raise the resources that we need to be competitive. And I've already raised twice as much money as Governor Dayton this year. Mm -hmm. And I've raised significantly more than any other Republican running. And that's relevant because we need a candidate that can get the message out. And you know, we're now on air with television ads, with radio ads, with a big robust IT effort, online uh, effort, social media. And we need candidates that can get that job done. And so that's where we put our time. And we have uh, uh, another question, and this is uh, from another uh, viewing audience member. Her name is Karen, and uh, she, her question is, how will Scott change the welfare system in this state? Well, Karen, thanks for that. I, I think one of our priorities needs to be moving people from welfare to work. And we need, you know, we need to have a strong economy in order to do that and, and have you know, more jobs available. And there's places where we need to pare back, uh, you, know, you know, this ever-increasing welfare system that we have. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do is tighten Medicaid eligibility requirements. You know, one of our, our, our fastest growing part of state government is health and human services, and we're spending too much there. So to me, uh, making sure that we're, we're putting those dollars in, uh, in the places they're really needed, people with, with physical disabilities, with mental handicaps, they need our help, but we should tighten the eligibility requirements. And frankly, I'm the only one calling to end MNsure, which is Obamacare in this state. Our state just spent $400 million of our state taxpayer dollars to bail out Obamacare this year. And I'm the only one calling to end that. And we'll show decisive leadership on that. And uh, Dallas, I, I believe that we have a, a phone caller on the line. Uh, can we connect with that phone caller right now? Hello, caller? Uh, yes, uh, Scott, I had the opportunity to talk to you at one of the conventions, and your running mate, uh, Karen Housley, uh, authored a great bill. It says you cannot build a school within a quarter mile of a dump, and if if it's an existing school, you must notify the parents if it exceeds uh, toxic levels for residential. In other words, you couldn't build a house on the deal, on the on that land. Now, the... It was a good bipartisan bill. In fact, the majority of the Democrats on that bill, there was three, two Republicans, three Democrats, but all three Democrats voted against their own, mm. own bill that they authored. And the reason they did that is in the Matamidi School District where the school was done, Aaron Brockovich had offered to come to testify in the Senate in the Environmental Committee. Now, if this bill, if you're elected, would you support bringing that bill back to the floor? Uh, it's obviously the Democrats' word doesn't mean anything when they author a bill and they they simply go across party lines. And and the reason it is 
Matamita is the only one out of 334 school districts that sent anybody to uh, bring and oppose this legislation. Senator Chuck Weger, uh, who, who represents the Education Policy and Finance Committee, both, and then Representative, or, or, Ren, or Representative Peter Fisher, in, in charge of, in the Environmental Committee over there in the House, both of those refused to allow it to get to an environmental committee where Aaron Brockovich offered to come do it. And I, and I believe Karn would reauthor that bill uh, come up the next session. Would you support it and hear that bill? Scott, yeah. thanks for the call. Yeah, well, I appreciate that question. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, one of the reasons I'm excited about having Karn as a running mate is, is you know, she's now spent this time in the Senate uh, and has a feel for you know, what that process is like. And I'm frankly, I'd follow her lead on this one. Because uh, she spent time studying it already, and uh, and um, you know, you know, I think has already has a thoughtful view on it. I think there's a broader question here, though, which is how do we deal with these environmental issues that are coming forward? And I'll tell you, one of the one of the 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 real issues this fa the state's facing right now is this polymet mine up in northern Minnesota. Mm. Uh, you know, and it affects everyone because you know here's a a company that wants to reopen a mine. It's been trying for seven years. It will create 360 jobs and half a billion dollars of annual economic benefit to the St. Louis County region. And our governor has come out and said he's not supporting it. And he's calling us, me, and, and my opponents in the governor's race irresponsible for supporting this. Well, that makes no sense. Here, here you have a company that is ready to go to meet the environmental standards that have been set up there around water quality that are 25 times more clean and restrictive than the water that we drink in our tap water right down here in the Twin Cities. They're ready to go to meet that standard and they still aren't allowed to open. Well, this doesn't make sense. We've got to do a better job of finding that balance between wanting to be you know, you know, uh, protective of our, of our environment but having a prosperous economy. And I'll make uh, breaking those log jams a priority. You know, one thing I found interesting, too, was that uh, Governor Dayton announced, his campaign announced, that he was only going to take part in a certain amount of debates. I know he was absent from the Farm Fest uh, just last week. Uh, every other governor's candidate was there. Um, he, he, what do you think about that? I mean, do you, are there too many governor's debates, or is he shying away from the issue? Well, look, I do think Governor Dayton is really showing a lack of leadership. You know, he, 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 he constantly goes back on decisions he made previously. Uh, he doesn't have a firm grasp on what's going on. He doesn't read these bills before he signs them. And, and I think the citizens of this state are taking note of that. And we're going to be out there with a very clear message about how we're going to put forth ideas that will make all Minnesotans' lives better. And, and I look forward to having a chance to talk directly with the governor about that. Hmm. Well, I can't, uh, I can't believe how fast the uh, time's going here, but I, I wanted people to get a chance just to get a, to know you a little more about your background. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just going to ask you some questions, if you could answer them. Mm -hmm. uh, first, what's your ethnic background, <laughs> and uh, when did your ancestors come to America and Minnesota? Well, on my mom's side of the family, it was my great-grandparents came from Norway and Sweden okay. in the late 1800s, so like a lot of Minnesotans. Mm -hmm. On my dad's side, uh, it was my great-grandmother that came from Denmark, and then my great-grandfather's side, the honor namesake, actually uh, came to South Carolina in the 1600s. Mm -hmm. So that one wow. line here a long time, but the rest uh, recent immigrants. Mm -hmm. And where did you grow up? I grew up in Mound, born in Fridley. Uh, but grew up in Mound on the west side of the Twin Cities. Nice. And uh, how and where did you meet your wife? Well, it's funny. So I met Jamie in L.A. I was working there at the time, and she was finishing college. And it turns out that our mothers went to Richfield High School together, and she's oh, wow. from Minnesota, too. <laughs> and when I met her, she actually was about to, to be an on-air reporter and had just gotten a job offer in Raleigh. I had three weeks to convince her not to do that. <laughs> Which, which, to my good fortune, she, <laughs> she didn't. And, and uh, we got married back here in the Twin Cities in 1994. So it's our 20th anniversary this month. Congratulations. And, uh, and then as we started having our kids, who are 12, 11, and 6, uh, we decided to move back here to raise them here and have them be in the same great environment and be by the grandparents and the like. And uh, we're thrilled we did that. But frankly, we worry about their future, which is, is part of the reason I'm running for governor. Mm -hmm. And wh where do you uh, see the state of Minnesota 10, 20 years from now, are your kids going to want to stick around here? 
create jobs, work, grow family. Yeah. Well, I'm optimistic about the possibility of a, of a very uh, energetic, robust future for Minnesota. And, and it's why I'm running, because I know from my business experience, when you see something going the wrong way, you want to change it quickly. And this state is making poor decisions on regulations, taxes, and, and having government in the way instead of out of the way and having a prosperous economy. But if we can get those changes made, we could see this state thriving in a way that is really leading the nation. You know, we are an excellent state. The people here are terrific. We have a, a, you know, an incredible work ethic. We have abundant resources. I mean, this state has so much opportunity, and we just need to let it flourish. And so I see Minnesota 10 years from now being a state that is literally leading the nation in, in so many categories, in, in job creation and education, where you know we, we've got to get back on the path of excellence. Uh, but we should be a leader, and, and you know, I'm looking forward to, to doing the things we need to do to put the state on that path. Mm -hmm. And how did you come to the decision to run for governor? Well, you know, it was back to this idea of, of when you've seen something going the wrong way, change it. And I was looking for you know, who I might support. You know, I had been involved in politics and helping others. I helped Norm Coleman, Tim Pawlenty when he ran for president, then Mitt Romney. I was Mitt Romney's finance chair here in Minnesota. And as I looked at who might run, I just didn't see someone I thought would have that you know, decisive approach to really tackling the issues that need to be tackled. And so I decided to put my business career on hold and, and, and push on that. And, and frankly, I think we are seeing that you know, my opponents are nice guys, but they're already apologizing for what they can't get done. And I want to push forward how our principles will make people's lives better and that we really can reduce the amount government spends and reprioritize where we put money, put more into roads and bridges and the core infrastructure needs of this state. And we can get better results at the same time. And that we can w unwind bad programs that don't work like Minsure. And so we're showing that kind of declarative leadership and, and I'm glad that I'm doing it because I think it really does need doing and, uh, and, and you know, we can get this state going in a better path. And because I'm not looking for a career in politics, I'm free to make the decisions in the best interest of the citizens of this state. I won't be beholden to special interests. And I think Minnesotans will appreciate that. So you're the only uh, candidate that advocates for scrapping Minsure entirely. And a question that some people have is uh, two of them. Well, why aren't the other candidates supporting that? And also, if we were to scrap Minsure, what implications would that have for Minnesotans who have already bought insurance through Minsure? Sure. You know, we're the only campaign that came out early and said, you know, not only do we have this broken website that doesn't work, but mm -hmm. the whole fundamental program is flawed. You know, it's predicated on the idea that private insurance signups wouldn't be in sufficient volume to cover the public program signups. We're now seeing the price take of that. $400 million of our taxpayer dollars going to bail it out. Well, we came out early with that statement because we studied it, we looked at what the options are, and we said, this is the best answer. Let's not put good money after bad. I think the other guys took, you know, the e politically easier approach. But you have to ask them why they haven't realized that this is the wrong path. That you know, we have too many Republican leaders that are willing to figure out how to fund failed DFL programs. And here's another example. And we need to have leaders that will look at what are the best solutions, how do we get the results we want, and what are, what's the path to get there. And if that means unwinding something that didn't make sense, let's do that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we can move our, our folks that signed up on the Minsure exchange to the federal exchange. You know, that's going to be an easier thing to do than trying to get this exchange fixed. You know, I've started software companies. I understand a little bit about how this process works. And you know, one thing I knew from that experience, software real, rarely comes in on time and on budget. And we're seeing that here in our state. And and you know, let's not spend more of our money doing something that's already redundant. Let's put our resources into how do we improve health care outcomes for all Minnesotans and lower health care costs and have more transparency, improve wellness you know, for our Medicaid recipients. That's where I'll put my effort. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, one last uh, question from our viewing audience. This is from Mariah De La Paz, and he, she wants to know, what is Scott going to do about the undocumented and uh, in terms of the state of Minnesota, of course. Sure. 
Well, thanks for that question. You know, I'm the only candidate running for governor who's openly called on our governor to ask President Obama to not move this immigration crisis that we're currently seeing with these illegal children coming uh, from our southern border to our state's border. And this is an important issue for Minnesotans. We've already had 173 illegal children dropped off here. We don't know where they are. And our state taxpayer dollars are being used to support them in a way that's unfair to our citizens. And I'll tell you, when, when a company hires an undocumented worker and, and you know, now offers its products at a lower cost, you know, that's unfair to the legal workers in this state. And we'll look to protect the rights of the legal citizens of our state and enforce the laws that are on the books. And go, shift into that in a little bit, it, you know, being a Hispanic American, one of the, the, the big issues for me, especially in Minnesota, and it, it just breaks my heart every time I see this statistic, is that Minnesota is essentially the last state in the entire nation in terms of achievement gap. If you're Hispanic American, if you're African American, uh, or even uh, Asian Americans in, in certain communities here in Minnesota, you have m uh, a much, much lower graduation rate. Uh, reading and math skills are uh, much lower uh, compared to uh, their white counterparts. Why do you think this is, and what can we do to make education in Minnesota more fair for everybody? Yeah, well, it's a real shame. Uh, you know, the Hispanic graduation rate in our state is dead last in the country. And when you look at all minorities, we're last. Shameful. Uh, I think that is ridiculous. It, it's unacceptable. And what we need to do is focus on results. And that means let's make sure we have the best teachers teaching our kids and give local schools the opportunity to hire those teachers and retain them and call out the teachers that aren't doing as good a job. And that means more school choice. So have dollars follow the students so parents can choose do they want to send their kid to a public school, a chartered school, a private school, or home school? Um, let, let's get wasted dollars out of administrative costs where over half the money goes today and put it into the classroom so that schools could pay teachers more and give them more resources to use. But, but let's pay those teachers more based on performance. And that means getting rid of teacher tenure and getting rid of this law we have where it's illegal for a school to terminate any teacher other than the last one hired. We've got to look out for the interests of the students. And I'll tell you, we have a governor who is trapping poor, vulnerable children in failing schools. And I just think we can't tolerate that. Mm -hmm. And how about taxes? You know, we hear a lot about uh, cutting corporate tax rates and, and different types of tax rates for others. What sort of uh, tax reductions can we have where people, working families in the middle class, can see more money in their paycheck and also be able to save more money? Because one struggle many families have in Minnesota is saving money. A lot of people are just living month to month, paycheck to paycheck, paying this bill, delaying this bill, then paying it, shifting money around. What, what can we do to put more money back in, in families' pockets? Well, I'll tell you, it's an important topic. And, and we got to tackle it from multiple parts. First, we got to have a stronger economy and more jobs and having you know jobs that pay higher wages. Mm. And lowering our tax rates along with reducing regulation burdens and increasing how quickly the government operates in terms of getting permits to companies, all that goes together in a way that can create a stronger economy. And we have to do that so people can earn more. We want them to keep more of what they earn too which means lowering tax rates for those individuals, but it means other things too. For instance, you know, um, a, a lower income family in Minnesota spends 11% of what they spend every year on electricity costs. Wow. The governor just increased their electricity costs. Well, that's completely unfair to those families. And he did it just because of, of you, know, you, know, you know, someone wanting to have this solar and wind mandate out there that, that's proving to not be effective in, 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 in what its mission was set out to accomplish, and it's harming the lives of Minnesota families. So we got to take that back the other way. Hmm. Well, Scott, I certainly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to stop here at the SCC Television Studios, and I'll give you the last uh, 30 seconds to a minute to address everyone and say whatever you want. Great. Well, I appreciate you having me on, and I just ask that, that you come and vote on August 12th, this coming Tuesday. Uh, Karen Housley, my running mate, and I are going to really put our attention on how we make this state better for everyone. And I think because we're not looking for a career in politics, 
we will make those best decisions on behalf of Minnesota citizens and we're the only ones that are looking to reduce spending in a way they'll give more money and you know put it more into families pockets and end this min share program the only one calling to halt the immigration crisis the only one calling for term limits and we'll have the money available to beat the governor in November which is something that everyone should have on their minds so I'd appreciate your support and please come to our website at honor for governor h o n o u r f o r governor dot com uh, to learn more about me and uh, you know, give any comments or ask any questions. So thanks so much. Scott Honor, thank you for uh, coming on the show and uh, best wishes with the campaign. Thanks so much. Thank you. That's Scott Honor. Uh, privilege to have him live in the studios. And uh, it was just great getting to know him. Encourage everybody to go to his website again, honorforgovernor.com. We got the primary coming up. It, it, the responsibility is really on your shoulders to make sure that if you haven't voted yet in the primary to do so on Tuesday, encourage your friends to get out there and go and vote too. And, and don't do so blindly. And I know I'm preaching to the choir for people who are watching this show, but it's just so important to get out there and understand who it is that you're voting for and the policies that they support because what they do in St. Paul matters. It matters to you, to your family, and to our future. So get out there and be active. And with that, we're going to uh, play a quick uh, video uh, that shows uh, Scott's big endorsement from Laura Ingram, and we'll uh, play that right now. Mm -hmm. Race is easier, her race is the same. Don't let them tell you no. Tell yourselves yes. We will do it, we can do it, we must do it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for getting out on August 12th for Scott Honor. I want you to get everyone you know. I don't care if you have to drag them to the polls, get them in cars, you know, <laughs> tell them we're going on a treasure hunt. Whatever you have to do, get them to the polls and get them to vote. Don't let the establishment party in this state run this political party into the ground. Can't do it. Got to reinvigorate it. He's the beginning. Great to be here. An event, I think it was uh, last week, and uh, it's a pretty impressive endorsement there. And, you know, Scott definitely not, uh, uh, you know, he hasn't run for office before. This is his first time. So uh, it's always good to see new people, new blood, new ideas uh, getting out there and for people to do that. So, uh, Scott Honor, thank you again for uh, coming on the Tony Hernandez show. And uh, with that, we have uh, uh, our little guest here. Uh, this is his second appearance that he's ever made. It's our little Sonny Maximilian. Max, can you say hi to everybody? Can you say hi? Huh? Do you remember being on here before? I'm here with my <laughs> wife, Leona. Leona? It's Hello. been a while since uh, you've been on. It has, yes. I think the last time you were on, it was, uh, it was right after uh, we had, we had little Max. So. But I wanted to bring Leona on the show and Max here because, you know, it's kind of what we were talking about with Scott, with what our representatives are doing in St. Paul, with what they're doing in uh, Washington, D.C., all of that matters. And it's one of the reasons that got me involved in politics in uh, uh, these issues is because I understand and I can see how much it affects us. It affects the amount of money you can make. It affects the types of jobs you can get. It affects how much money you can save. It affects your, your kids' futures. It affects the schools that they go to and the policies that are pushed down to these schools. It makes a difference in every facet of your life. And I don't think we're always aware of that because <laughs> We uh, too often get distracted with like the day-to-day -day, uh, burdens of life, the stresses, the, the job stuff, the school stuff, the how are we going to pay the bills stuff. And uh, I think it's just really important that we keep these things in, in perspective and, and, and remember or understand how they do affect us. Right, buddy? Right? <laughs> right? But I brought Leona on because she's going to offer us a, a perspective as a, a mother and as a nurse. And um, so, Leona, thank you for uh, being here. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, we just wanted to talk about, first of all, uh, what did you think about Scott Honor's interview? Were you uh, impressed with the things he was saying? I was impressed. I was impressed with um, some of the things that he said about education, which is, as I'm sure people can guess, something that's important to me. Yeah. Um, 
and I'm impressed by his background. Um, just kind of a normal guy who cares about his family and cares about the people around him and hopefully isn't too tainted um, by politics as politics have a way to taint people. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I was impressed. It was good to hear. So as a young, as a young mother, and when you're assessing which candidates to vote for, what issues are your top issues? Like, do you look at social issues, or is the issue of life, or is it education, or the economy? What's your number one issue when you look at who are you going to vote for? My, I have to pick just one. Your top issue. My top issue is the issue of life because <laughs> I think that there are so many devastating things happening in our country and around the world that I can't support a candidate who doesn't understand the inherent dignity of each human life. And so to me, that spreads to everything. I can't trust someone's stance on education or on the economy or on immigration or on welfare if they don't believe that people have an inherent right to their own life. So to me, that's the number one issue. And from that, I believe stems more cohesive um, beliefs and policies in terms of the things I mentioned, education, health care, welfare, immigration, war, and on and on. So when you say that your most important issue is the issue of life, then do you think that that's something that they should be campaigning about and talking about constantly everywhere they go? Or is it more of a, <coughs> oh, bless you. <laughs> Or is it more of a uh, litmus test where you want to know if the person is pro-life and then once you find out that they are, then you have sub-issues that are, uh, you know, somewhere along the sliding scale? I think the latter is okay. I don't think that it needs to be something that someone is preaching about every time they speak. Um, I do think that the policies that they do speak about, like I said, will be more cohesive if they are truly working for the dignity of life because that will affect their policies on war, on capital punishment, on education, immigration, health care, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But no, I don't think that whether or not someone is pro-life in all of those issues needs to be discussed every time they speak. Mm -hmm. And you uh, graduated from nursing school from the University of Minnesota uh, not too long ago, a few years Three back. Years. Um, so you kind of grew, you went to school there and, you know, it's a heavily democratic uh, voting tendency comes out of that campus. And mm -hmm. did you see a lot of uh, like propaganda or influences on the campus that you should vote a certain way or mm -hmm. think a certain way? Absolutely. And can you describe that? Um, I remember being on the bus on election day when Obama was running for office and these, um, pieces were being handed out, lit pieces were being handed out to all the students, and they literally only had information about Obama. They didn't mention anything, good or bad, about anyone else. It, it literally said something, I don't, I don't want to say that it said college students should vote for Obama, but it said something like, you should vote for Obama because blah, blah, blah. And I heard people around me saying, yeah, I didn't really know who I was going to vote for, so I guess I'll vote for him. And that was just the only thing that was being handed out. And I can't really blame anyone. If that's who someone thinks the best candidate was, then I guess they were doing their job and they were certainly getting the vote out for Obama. And no one was out there doing anything different. But it mm. was, to me, it seemed, it seemed like propaganda. And mm. it was kind of sad that people didn't seem interested in even researching anyone else. They just accepted this lit piece that was handed to them on election day. And granted, that was a conversation on one bus. I'm not saying that's how everyone there was thinking, but mm -hmm. it was eye-opening to see that from even a few people. And have you seen uh, your own personal political viewpoints? Have they changed at all over, uh, over time, or have you pretty much held consistent beliefs? You know, they say, you know, that uh, when you're young, a lot of people are, 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 are more liberal, and then as they get older, they turn a little more conservative. Um, how about with you? Did, did you see any of that? And have you seen any changes in, or any major uh, stance changes in your own viewpoints? I think that I've become, at least in my perception, more of a realist over time. And in that, I've become a little bit more libertarian-ish. I don't think a true libertarian would call me a libertarian. But 
in my opinion, I'm much more of one. And it's because I recognize that people in power are human, just like the rest of us. Um, unfortunately, God himself will not be our president. And so given that we have imperfect human beings in power, making decisions that affect all of us, I think that the less power those individuals have, the better it is for the rest of us. So I do think that you can pretend that everyone who holds power is doing things for the good of everyone else. You can pretend that a utopia is possible, but I simply think it is not possible in this world. And so the less laws, the less power in the hands of the few, the better for all the rest of us. Do you ever feel that uh, being a woman, you know, you watch the mainstream media, MSNBC or, or other things, and you'll hear the term war on women that became popular in, in the last election cycle, that Republicans have a war on women, whether it's issues of birth control or abortion, or they look at it as, as, as masculine um, agendas to try to control women or bring us back to the, bring us back to the Stone Age. Um, do you do you believe that there is a, a, a war on women and, and is it founded correctly? Um, I believe that there is a war on women. I wouldn't say that it's from Republicans necessarily. Um, I think that I think that being a woman and I will say being a man, but you're asking about women in particular and I'm a woman, so I'll speak just to that. I think that being a woman today is difficult because I think there are a lot of forces uh, pushing you to do different things, to be the perfect mom always involved with her child, to be the perfect career woman who gives everything that she has to her career and is excellent in her career. I think that there are a lot of forces calling you to be excellent in everything, and I don't think that anyone can be truly excellent in everything. And so I think um, that that's uh, one difficult force that women face. I think another difficult force that women face is the fact that um, we're taught that in order to be to be free and to be a strong independent woman that you need certain things and I will bring up birth control because to me um, that's a very important issue and I know that it's a hot but a hot topic issue I know that literally the majority of all women of childbearing age use some type of birth control um, However, I really don't think that it's good for women. I don't think it's good for women physically. I don't think it's good for women emotionally. I don't think it ends up being good for women's relationships, whether or not they're married. And I don't think that any of these things are being talked about. Um, so I think those are two forces that women are facing. Um, it's expected that you're on birth control and, and you're taught to think that that will liberate you. And then you also have these forces of career versus family and all of that so I think I would I don't know if those things mean that it's a war on women but I do think that um, there are some forces today that make it very difficult to be a woman well there's also the uh, the perception out there that uh, that contraception in its pill form or medical form or other forms it is the only form of birth control or the only way to not get pregnant is to take the pill every day or to have or to use some of those other methods. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about uh, some of the myths that surround that? And also, what is an alternative for women who are seeking to not get pregnant? Is there anything else that they can do? Yes, um, I certainly don't think that women have to be pregnant all of the time or that anytime you have sex, you have to get pregnant. I don't believe that. Um, I think that women's bodies are designed in such a way that you simply cannot get pregnant all of the time. Um, and I think that the more women are educated, um, and also the more women are educated on their bodies and the more that men are educated on women's bodies, the more they can work together to make fully informed decisions about when they want to have children and when they think they should wait to have children. Um, and I think that different methods of fertility awareness are beautiful. Um, there are two methods in particular, the Creighton method and the Marquette method that came out of both of those universities. That's where the names come from. Um, and there are still physicians and scientists who are researching these methods to fine tune them more and to understand them better and better. And I think these methods are beautiful for multiple reasons. They do help you to not get pregnant um, when you 
need to wait or when it's not a good time to get pregnant, but I certainly don't think that they're simply an alternative birth control. I think that they're very different and there's so much more. Um, one, they're healthy for you. They don't require putting instruments or chemicals into your bodies. Um, two, they can help you to get pregnant. They can't, they don't just work to help prevent pregnancies. And unfortunately, um, infertility or subfertility, I think are sure. in some ways even stronger issues in a lot of people's lives than getting pregnant when they don't want to be pregnant. Um, so I think those methods are beautiful because they help you both to achieve and to prevent pregnancy. Um, and then the third reason why I think that they're not just an alternative birth control is that um, they really do affect your relationship. They require communication um, between the two people who are waiting to get pregnant or trying to get pregnant. And I'm not at all saying that people who use birth control don't communicate or don't have very healthy relationships with lots of communication, but using these methods of fertility awareness simply require you to have these discussions nearly every month about finances, about where your family is heading, about how you want your, the way that you raise your children to look, about what your priorities are, and on and on. And I think that that's so good um, to discuss those things. What is the difference between uh, an abortifacient and abortion? Um, an abortifacient is, well, you're talking about birth control that can be an abortifacient. Um, it, I mean, it's not different than an abortion in that it ends up ending a life. The way that an abortifacient in a birth control works acts differently because it's all chemicals, so it's certainly different than a surgical abortion. Um, but I think a lot of people don't know that hormonal birth control can act as an abortifacient. Um, and most hormonal birth controls first try to prevent ovulation, but sometimes they fail at that. If they fail to prevent ovulation, they then um, try to prevent fertilization, where the sperm and the, the egg meet. If they prevent either of those, they are not working as an abortifacient. Mm -hmm. However, they sometimes fail at both of those purposes. And then the third thing that the hormonal birth control will try to do is it will prevent implantation. So there is a human, this fertilized egg, with all of the DNA that that individual human needs and will have for the rest of their life. And the hormones try to prevent um, the uterine lining from accepting that person, that fertilized egg. And so if the hormonal birth control works in that third way, it is then acting as an abortifacient. It, it is an abortifacient. It's, mm -hmm. it's ending that life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so why do you think so many women choose to just use birth control? I mean, it's probably around 90, over 90 percent of women, uh, Catholic women, women from all, all, all over choose this. And you know you're not necess you're not condemning people who do that by no means. But why do you think it's so popular? Because it's all they hear. I think it's heartbreaking. It's all they hear from their moms. It's all they hear from their friends, from their aunts, from their coworkers, from their physicians, from the nurses they meet with if they have to be in a hospital at some point, yeah. it's simply all they hear. Yeah. It's all they hear on the news. It's all they read in the paper. Um, I mean, I've read countless websites and countless blogs, and I, I think the misinformation about birth control is just astounding. Even the statistics um, in so many places are incorrect. Um, the way that things work are incorrect. You're told time and time again that hormonal birth control never acts as an abortifacient, whereas if you read the teeny tiny print <laughs> on at least the pills that I've looked at, um, and I have only been able to read one in person, but if you read the teeny <laughs> tiny print, it actually does tell you how it works, but that's not what anyone hears. And I don't know why you would read the teeny tiny print unless you're like me and you're interested in seeing what it actually says. So, so I think the misinformation is heartbreaking. Um, because there are serious risks to hormonal birth control. So why do you, th why do you, th I mean, and again, going back to that, um, you know, if there is so much, if there is so much that information, you know, if you l listen to an ad about a different type of medication, you'll hear a litany of all the negative side effects and consequences, but you don't really hear those same side effects with birth control. And I'm just wondering, 
why and then what what are some of the side effects and um, do we know about them all i don't think most people do know about them all um i personally know um a couple people who've experienced serious side effects blood clots um and one is a physician and claims very strongly that it, it is because of the birth control given how many years she was on it. Um, if you are on hormonal birth control for longer than six years, the risks, especially of the serious side effects, increase. I don't know why, by what percentage, but I know that they <laughs> increase. Um, so that's, I think some, a lot of people don't even know the length of time. And think of a girl who starts hormonal birth control even at 16, which is older than a lot of other people start it. Um, by the time she's 22, she's already reached that six-year mark, and 22 is pretty young. You still have a lot of childbearing years in front of you. Um, so can you say that again? You're only, you're only really supposed to use it for six years? No, it's, I, I mean, I don't actually think you're ever supposed to use it in terms of the health of your body, but after six years, the side effects increase. The, the chance of experiencing the side effects increases Got after it. six years. Um, so blood clots and stroke, those are you know, the most serious, those obviously can lead to death. Um, other side effects that are minor, quote unquote, but to me would be major, um, can be increased weight gain, acne, decreased sex drive, which to me seems so ironic. Um, moodiness, depression, I, I mean, these are not things that women should have to live with their entire lives because of a pill they're taking that they don't need to be taking. And one thing I do wanna mention is it's not just in the pill, These hormones are in other types of birth control. So they're in even <coughs> IUD, which some people think doesn't have hormones, but there yeah, are some yeah. of the same hormones even in yeah. the IUD. So it's just, it's something to consider that even in, if you're not actually taking the pill, in most cases, you're still receiving some of the hormone. The mm -hmm. NuvaRing, you still get some of the hormone. Um, Depo-Provera, the shot, you're still getting the hormones. So um, it's really hard to not get any of the hormones that are harmful unless you're not using any of the artificial birth control at all. And do you see any type of uh, a change? Sorry, Max is grabbing my microphone. Do you see any type of a change, cultural change, cultural shift in maybe more women choosing uh, more natural forms or couple? I shouldn't say just women. It's a, it's a choice by the man and the woman to, yes, it to is. make active decisions and to learn more about your body. Do you see Which that changing in anytime soon? And, and if, if so, what is going to be the catalyst for it or, or is just just this is the new world this is the way that it is i'm hopeful that as people become more concerned about um, using our resources responsibly more green if you will i'm hopeful that 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 will carry over into this realm of birth control mm -hmm. um i'm also hopeful that men will start to recognize more and more how harmful these things can be and will stand up for the woman in their lives. And I really believe that yeah. if men had more information about this, they would never let their wives, girlfriends, any sisters, moms, that would be an awkward conversation, but um, use these types of hormonal birth control. Um, so I'm hopeful that it just uh, that knowledge will increase and people will realize that this isn't good and I also I think it's a good point um, that it shouldn't just be the woman and I think it's sad that it's sort of become <laughs> expected that the woman does this thing to prevent pregnancy and the man doesn't have to think about it or worry about it at all and I think that is another beautiful thing about fertility awareness yeah and one, one interesting too th that we found is by doing NFP or natural family planning is that you meet more people that do, mm -hmm. and it's not a, uh, it, it's pretty interesting. You'll see some yeah. very liberal people. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. and more hippie-ish people doing it because it's natural, and you'll see conservative yeah. people doing it yeah. as well because it's natural. Yep. And so you really see the uh, coming together of two it's different true. types of people. It's but, true. But Leona, Beautiful thank thing. you for your time. We're coming to the end of the show. Maximilian, thank you for being on the show. Can you say goodbye to everybody? Say dada. And uh, yeah, we broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. May God bless yeah. you. May God bless America. And vaya con Dios. <laughs>